cannot afford to let TransCanada once again dupe us into permitting an even more dangerous pipeline than Keystone was. For as they say, and we all know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Somebody from Texas tried to say that once, but we know the statement. I urge support for my amendment and yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman from Tennessee uh, yields back his time. The gentleman from Nebraska, I'll reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Tennessee did yield back. Oh, he yielded back. I yielded he back. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, there's no doubt the facts are that on the Keystone, but not the Keystone XL, uh, there have been 12 leaks. Uh, 12 leaks of as little as five gallons to 400 barrels of a recent one. And those were determined to be part uh, or caused not by the, the safety of the pipeline, but by uh, valves that were mal-manufactured. There was a manufacturing problem that within a 12-hour period, they were up and running again. Those have all been uh, replaced. That's the type of response that we expect under our pipeline laws. Uh, and so I think the issues here are better placed in our discussions of pipeline safety, of which both Transportation Committee and Energy and Commerce will begin working on soon. Uh, and so I just don't see the need uh, for this type of an amendment or fact-finding uh, to be put into this bill. Uh, with that, I yield back. The gentleman from Nebraska yields back his time, all time having been yielded back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed would to. would like to ask for a roll call vote. The Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, will be postponed. It is now in order to consider amendment number 6, printed in House Report 112-181. What purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut rise? An amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number six, printed in House Report number 112-181, offered by Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Pursuant to House Resolution 370, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield uh, myself as much time as I may consume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My uh, amendment before us today asks a simple question. Why should America shoulder new environmental risks to help power the economy of China? Many members have come to the floor today to document the considerable ecological and public health threats posed by the development of the Trans-Canada Keystone XL pipeline. In addition to producing 40 percent more life cycle greenhouse gas emissions than conventional oil, the recent Exxon pipeline spill in Montana's Yellowstone River serves as a stark reminder of the very real risks posed by these kinds of pipeline projects. However, in discounting these facts, the proponents of Keystone XL assert that without the new pipeline, Canada's dirty tar sands oil will be shipped to China and to other overseas markets. This, however, simply isn't true. Without access to a major new shipping terminal and refining hub on the Gulf Coast, Canada's tar sands will remain stranded on the North American continent. Indeed, Keystone XL is essential uh, to the economic expansion of Canadian tar sands because it opens up new trade routes to the east. Current pipeline infrastructure carries tar sands oil to the Midwest, but no further. By 2005, existing markets will no longer be sufficient to absorb this increased tar sands production. So the Keystone XL pipeline will provide that new market to China for this oil. Indeed, earlier this year, the CEO of Valero Energy, one of the companies that has signed up to ship oil through Keystone XL, said this. He said that the future of refining in the United States is in exports. So America is increasingly now the global middleman in world oil exports. Our oil exports have doubled in the last five years. And the question is this, shouldn't we have some say 
in where our oil goes. With the construction of this new pipeline, we're going to be shouldering all of the increased environmental risks that come with its construction to help meet the growing overseas oil demand of our economic competitors. How does that further the energy independence of the United States? So the amendment we're offering today with uh, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Welsh will merely make it clear that a decision to permit Keystone XL is a decision to, in part, help promote North American oil exports to China. Whether you like that or don't like that, we should at least admit that that is one of the byproducts of our action today. I'd urge my colleagues to support uh, this amendment and face the reality of the Keystone XL pipeline rather than just the rhetoric. And with that, I'd reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman may not reserve. I'll yield at uh, this point uh, the remainder of our time to Mr. Cohen of Tennessee. Right. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the uh, action of Mr. Murphy in yielding time. I rise in support of the Murphy-Cohen-Welch Amendment. This amendment sheds lights on the oil industry's attempt to pressure the U.S. into approving Keystone XL by threatening to export tar sands to China if we do not approve the type pipeline. Mr. Murphy is well stated. Canada has already said themselves, they can't get that oil out of Canada without this pipeline. They can't get it to China unless they build the pipeline. They want to build a pipeline through America over our, one of our most important aquifers, threatening our environment, our drinking water, so that Canada can get some oil to possibly go to China. And Canada cannot get it to China without going through the United States. It makes no sense. And the fact is this amendment, like the previous amendments, are just simply putting the facts, the truth, into this particular paper. There's nothing wrong with these facts. Nobody disputes the facts. In fact, the gentleman agreed on the previous amendment that there had been a dozen leaks of the Keystone pipeline. He mentioned that some of them were very small. The average one's 1,000 barrels. So if the Keystone pipeline, which was the safest in the world, was not safe, what's wrong with mentioning it in the findings? And the same thing here. What they've said about China is just not true. The only feasible route to export tar sand to China is the Keystone XL. And that's what they're looking to do because it's not going to affect the United States' use of oil. Oil is a, is, is a commodity that the Canadians want to sell, and they're not going to give it to us any cheaper than they're going to give it to anybody else. They want to make money, and they want, but they've got opposition in their own country as well. We need to look out for the American people and not have some situation where maybe because Canada's helping us with oil in the Middle East that we're helping them with oil through our Midwest. America's Midwest is too important to sacrifice to some misguided adventure that Canada got into with us in the Mideast, all because of oil. So I would support the, the Murphy-Cohen-Welch Amendment and yield back my time to Mr. Murphy. I'd like to yield whatever time we have remaining to Mr. Rush of Illinois. for 30 seconds. Uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I stand in support of uh, Mr. Murphy's amendment. And this amendment replaces uh, a misleading finding about the export of tar sands with critical factual information. Uh, the only problem uh, that, the, that I see with the majority's uh, argument is that uh, Canada has really, uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, Mr. Cohen, that Canada has no way to send oil to China now and no realistic prospect of ever uh, doing, uh, uh, of ever sending oil to China. Uh, they won't do this anytime soon. So I think that this is a common sense amendment and I certainly stand in support of this amendment. Gentlemen's no, time has time. expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Nebraska rise? I rise in opposition of this amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first of all, the purpose of this pipeline is so that American citizens will have a reliable source of fuel made in America. That's the whole point of this. And the, there are companies that are expanding the refineries right now to be able to accept this crude. Now, it's been stated that 
if we don't use it, then this is not going to be used because it's landlocked. But nothing can be further from the truth. It's only 800 miles from the point that the, uh, the oil sands will be used to the Vancouver coast where it could be put on and would be put on tankers to be shipped to uh, China. Now, Enbridge is already in the permitting process for a pipeline that will link the uh, um, Athabasca fields in northern Alberta to a terminal in Kitimat, British Columbia. It's 525,000 barrels per day. So the statement that it'll be landlocked and never used is just simply flat wrong. That is not what the Canadians will do. To say that it's going to be sent to our refineries in Oklahoma, Chicago, Texas, and Louisiana so it could be then refined and put on just to on a tanker then to go south through the Panama Canal and through just makes no sense because we have the most stringent regulations in refining and on uh, cleaning the pr uh, or a clean process that adds a great deal more to the cost of refining. So it just makes no economic sense to do that. It'd be much cheaper just to put a, a, a pipeline uh, to the west coast of Canada, put it on tankers. It'd be much cheaper to do that. At this point, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I think the gentleman from Nebraska, you know, it, that line through Canada less than 800 miles long to add uh, an additional almost 10,000 miles to go through the Panama Canal to Shanghai doesn't make economic sense. And let's keep in mind, Canada is our neighbor. They are our friend, our most consistent and reliable ally and I trust the way they're going to be working on many things with this. But I also trust the workers who will work on this pipeline, American workers from here in the United States, well-trained people who have gone through good training program as, a, as apprentices and journeymen. Uh, construction of this pipeline will generate about $20 billion in economic output, perhaps $13 billion in direct uh, work on the pipeline itself. Now, some estimates have said that for every $1 billion you spend, an infrastructure. It yields about 35,000 jobs. That's some jobs that go for manufacturing, some jobs that go for the actual construction, and some jobs that go for all the supports that help those workers as well as the places they will spend money. Steam fitters and welders who make 45 to 50 dollars an hour. Operating engineers. Laborers who will earn between 23 and 31 dollars an hour. And this, this is a time we need to do this, not with more delays or other problems, but a time when we need jobs. Let's keep this in mind too. Construction of this pipeline with, with oils from Canada is going to make us less dependent on OPEC. Right now, we send $129 billion per year to OPEC. That's $129 billion in foreign aid, which we do not have to send to those countries there. $129 billion, which we don't have to be spending on countries that sometimes turn around and use U.S. dollars against our soldiers. And then we end up fighting for both sides of the war on terror. This is what we need to keep in mind. This is a jobs bill. This is a, a bill dealing with a friend, and this is a bill that makes a lot of sense, and we shouldn't put more delays and restrictions on this because we have to get off of our addiction to OPEC oil. With that, I yield back to the gentleman from Nebraska. Mr. Speaker, Nebraska. I urge uh, the defeat of this onerous and job-killing amendment. Yield back. The gentleman from Nebraska yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 7, printed in House Report 112-181. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 7, printed in House Report Number 112-181, offered by Mr. Rush of Illinois. Pursuant to House Resolution 370, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today's debate 
on fast tracking the Keystone XL pipeline by two months. Reminds me of a saying that adequately sums up uh, the plight before this Congress. Good sense minus common sense equals nonsense. With the current crisis that our nation faces on lifting the debt ceiling and other priorities for the American people, including the economy and jobs, it is incomprehensible that we are here debating a bill that is totally and absolutely unnecessary, completely futile, and is not even worth not one millisecond of Congress's time. Mr. Speaker, as written, this bill will force the administration to issue the presidential permit for the pipeline within 30 days of the final environmental impact statement and no later than November 1st, 2011, regardless of whether or not the review process has been completed. This arbitrary, willy-nilly uh, timeline will reduce the allocated time that the federal agencies will have to determine the national interest in deciding whether this proposal uh, by almost two-thirds of the time that they need, while also reducing or eliminating the 30-day public comment period. Mr. Speaker, the amendment that I am offering will allow for 120 days after the final environmental impact or no later than January 1, 2012, for the president to issue a final decision on the Keystone XL pipeline. I believe that public input is a vital and necessary part of the permitting process. And I also believe that it is important for the various departments to weigh in with their national interest determination which this bill will severely curtail, if not completely eliminate. In fact, in conversations that my office has had with the State Department and the EPA, we were informed that it would cl cl be close to impossible for the responsible agencies to complete their due diligence and reply to the arbitrary timeline of November 1st uh, as this bill would mandate. Additionally, just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, the State Department publicly stated that this bill was, quote, unnecessary, end of quote, since the agency already plans to reach a final decision on the Keystone XL by the end of the year after first holding a series of public hearings in the very six states that this bill that uh, would be affected uh, by uh, uh, this bill and by the enacting of this bill. Mr. Speaker, whether you support the Keystone XL pipeline or not, it is extremely important that all of the relevant information and consequent impacts be considered so that an informed decision can be made. So I urge all my colleagues to support my amendment, which will allow for the appropriate time period for the public and the different agencies to weigh in while also mandating that the decision is made within a timely manner. With that, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Illinois reserves. What purpose does a gentleman from Nebraska Mr. rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, first want to state that this is an infrastructure bill. This is a $13 billion project, $13 billion spent in the United States employing United States workers. On the surface, um, 
My friend from Illinois' amendment seems fairly innocuous, just delaying this decision by 61 days. The point that I'd like to make is, is we've kind of, we've just had it with the delays. This isn't rushing or expediting. This is only weeks away from a three-year anniversary from the filing of the application when in comparison to other transcontinental pipelines that the average is 18 to 24 months. Uh, so it's time that we act. The date of November 1st was actually calculated by the time it would take the State Department uh, after they requested another round of town hall meetings to sufficient time to accomplish those. So there's just no reason to bump it back 60, this date from November 1st, 61 days to January 1st. And I would yield three minutes to the gentleman from Illinois. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for three minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the, the gentleman from Nebraska for uh, generously yielding. Uh, I'm also from Illinois, and uh, I, I can tell you in Illinois there's a, a very tough environment right now. We've got a tough budget, a lot of talk about the budget right now. We've got huge unemployment. We've got people that desperately want to go to work. And when I do town hall meetings, when I'm in the 11th district in towns like Joliet or when I'm in Ottawa or Princeton or some of those towns, I, I, I get this from a lot of people. Why can't we just become energy independent? Why can't we just become energy secure? And I think that, that's a great question. When people look at Washington, D.C. and they say Washington, D.C. is broken, I think one example of that is the fact that we can't get our act together and do what we need to do to increase oil that we're not pulling in from the Middle East. I mean, it's just very basic. How can we do anything in this Congress if we can't even agree that our partners to the north can bring their oil here for our consumption so we can come off of that oil we're buying from the Middle East that in some way is always going to fund the people that we're fighting overseas and the terrorists that we're fighting? But when we talk about the Keystone Pipeline, let me ask you, what, what does the pipeline mean for the United States and for Illinois? For starters, it means creating more than 100,000 American jobs. We've been seeing the jobs reports lately. They're not good. How would you like to add 100,000 American jobs? That's what we're offering. It means 1.3 million barrels of oil from our friends to the north, which means we need less oil from the Middle East, from Venezuela, and less oil from other countries that we can no longer rely on and are not friendly to the interests of the United States. What's bad about that? And it means $5.2 billion dollars in new property tax revenue for bankrupt states like my own, like Illinois. The North American Made Energy Security Act, it expedites a final decision on the Keystone Pipeline, a project that would allow millions of barrels of Canadian oil supplies to flow into the U.S. markets and requires the president to issue a final presidential permit decision by November 1, 2001. This bill does not require the president to accept the benefits of the Keystone Pipeline. It merely requires him to make a long overdue decision on this pipeline. The State Department has at their discretion the authority to decide if the U.S. benefits from this. The fact is that someone will benefit from the oil out of Canada. If it's not the United States, it will be China, unless we take immediate action to expand the Keystone Pipeline. And it'll be American businesses, American consumers, and those that are unemployed that are desperately seeking for a job in this terrible economy who will suffer the consequences from our inaction. According to the Department of Energy report, the pipeline extension will essentially eliminate our oil imports from the Middle East. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment and support the final passage, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, is recognized. Madam Speaker, may I inquire how much time do I have remaining? The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, has 30 seconds, and the gentleman from Nebraska also has 30 seconds. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I really, really want my friend from Illinois to know I don't have to travel to uh, Joliet, Illinois, or any other part of Illinois. I don't even have to come down to his district in Peoria to see unemployment, to see the jobless. I am not 
uh, standing here and uh, fighting against jobs, I am fighting for jobs. But I think at the same time that we fight for jobs, we have to also fight that the American people have input uh, in terms of making decisions such as this. Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker, I also believe uh, that at the end of the day, we want to ensure that this pipeline benefits America and not China. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized for 30 seconds. Gentlemen, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 8, printed in House Report 112-181. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Hawaii seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number eight, printed in House Report number 112-181, <coughs> offered by Ms. Hanabusa of Hawaii. Pursuant to House Resolution 370, the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Hanabusa, and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Hawaii. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield to myself as much time as I may need. The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this amendment requires that prior to the presidential permit approving the construction and operation of the Keystone XL pipeline, that it will not issue until such time that the Secretary of Energy, in consultation with the PHMSA, certify that the applicant has calculated a worst-case oil spill scenario for the proposed pipeline and has demonstrated to the satisfaction of the Secretary and the PHMSA that the applicant possesses the capability and technology to respond immediately and effectively to the worst case scenario. Mr. Speaker, the reason this amendment is so necessary is because we are talking about a 2,000 mile pipeline from Alberta to the Gulf Coast. It can actually, according to the bill itself, it will increase the production and the pipeline will carry 700,000 to 1.290 barrels of oil in a day. This pipeline will go over important aquifers and what we need to recognize is that the people of this great country after experiencing the BP oil spill expect us, expect us to address and recognize that that type of catastrophes may occur and what this amendment does is it gives the people that assurance. I would also like to say, Mr. Speaker, that part of this amendment also gives the Secretary the opportunity to waive the requirement. If the Secretary and the PHMSA believe that the applicant has in fact completed a worst case discharge scenario, then they can say that this provision is no longer necessary. So, Mr. Speaker, this is, this is really for the people. It gives the people peace of mind that, in fact, we have addressed this situation, especially when we're going over aquifer and many people's lands, 2,000 miles. Mr. Speaker, with that, I reserve the remainder of my time. The woman from Hawaii reserves her time. What purpose does the gentleman from Nebraska rise? I rise in opposition of this amendment. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized for five minutes. I appreciate... Uh, the thoughts of the gentle lady from Hawaii. Uh, coming from Nebraska where it's the sand hills and the sensitive area and the Ogallala Aquifer, I want to make sure that the people in my state have the peace of mind and the confidence that the worst case scenarios have already been uh, modeled out and written into their plans. In fact, that's the whole premise of, of, of FIMSA. Uh, and so the analysis of a worst case scenario spill is already part of the application. Uh, it's part of the environmental impact statement and the supplemental environmental impact statement. Furthermore, it's demonstrated its response plan in event of the worst case discharge that the pumps will be stopped in nine minutes and the valves will shut 
in three minutes. So the worst case scenarios are actually part of the record so that uh, the, the entities that have to make the recommendation to the president already have that determination. Uh, then they'll use those facts and figures uh, and models to determine what to recommend to the president. Then the president can make that recommendation. So I believe that this uh, amendment is really superfluous and unnecessary. Uh, I reserve. Nebraska reserves its time. The gentlewoman from Hawaii is recognized. Mr. Speaker, can you tell me how much time I have left? The gentlewoman from Hawaii has three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I understand what the proponent of this measure is stating. However, let us also recognize that this bill, in, in its own requirements, says that not later than 30 days after the issuance of the final environmental impact statement, the President shall issue an order either granting or denying the presidential permit. You know, we're not here to slow this up. We're actually here to assist them if this is really what they want to do. The reason why is this. If you're very familiar with the environmental impact statement process, and we are in the comment period right now, that you know that after the comment period is done, that what will then happen is that you will then be able to file challenges to the EIS itself. What this does is it then creates the opportunity to say in a challenge to an EIS the sufficiency of which if it's challenged and the fact that it did not properly address the worst case scenario that there is a process in the law itself which will permit them to say hey we can look at the worst case scenario and I believe that any kind of construction project such as this it would be the worst case scenario argument that could bring it to a complete halt so given that Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this amendment because it really will give the people the peace of mind and if this is a project worthy of going forward that it does assist in that process. Thank you Mr. Speaker and I yield back. The gentleman from Hawaii yields back her time. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, is recognized. Thank you Mr. Chairman I, and I just I, I, I want to give a degree of confidence that this scenario has already been set forth. This is the environmental study, uh, page 3-99, maximum spill volumes. It's already been modeled out. It's already been determined. And, and just to provide further confidence, even the EPA that wrote a, a letter a few months ago uh, did not say anything about the maximum spills and whether the responses were appropriate or not. Most of theirs was on greenhouse gases. So this issue is pretty well settled. Uh, the facts are there for the, those who will make the recommendations and uh, I yield back and request uh, defeat of this amendment. Both sides yield back their time. The question on, is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Hanabusa. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Recorded vote. Mr. Pursuant Chairman. to clause six of rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from that. Hawaii, Ms. Hanabusa, will be postponed. It is now in order to consider amendment number nine, printed in House Report 112-181. What purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number nine, printed in House Report number 112-181, offered by Mr. Johnson of Georgia. And I move. Pursuant to House Resolution 370, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to speak today on H.R. 1938, the North American Energy Security Act of 2011, and my amendment to this legislation. I oppose H.R. 1938, which would accelerate the approval of the Keystone Koch Brothers XL pipeline. No one knows how much air pollution this pipeline will cause or how the pollution will impact the public health. My amendment, which has been endorsed by the National Resources Defense Council and the Sigaria Club, is common sense. I'm simply requesting a thorough analysis of the potential health risk 
that uh, should be completed before any decision is made to begin construction. Even though the State Department has submitted two environmental impact statements on the Keystone Koch Brothers XL pipeline, the Environmental Protection Agency has found that neither statement included a satisfactory evaluation of the increased air pollution that would come as a result of this pipeline's operation. Communities surrounding the oil refineries that would uh, be along the transportation route for these raw tar sands crude uh, are already exposed to dirty air. Approval of the Koch Brothers Keystone XL pipeline will only make it worse. The raw tar sands crude is more toxic and acidic than other types of crude. Raw tar sands crude produces significantly more harmful pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions than conventional crude oil due to the complex refining process it must go through before it reaches gas pumps in China. As this type of crude has only been exported to the United States from Canada for a relatively short period of time, there has not been a thorough study on how its transport would affect air pollution in our nation. It's troubling that the construction of the Keystone Koch Brothers XL pipeline, which would transport 900,000 barrels of this crude oil daily, should take place before such a study is ever done. We have a responsibility to the American people to properly assess what risk the construction of this pipeline may pose to our health. It would be irresponsible for us to sweep these concerns under the rug just to rush this project to the finish line. Valid questions have been raised about health risks associated with the increased air pollution this pipeline will produce and these questions deserve legitimate answers. For this reason, I'm requesting that a study be conducted to measure the health impacts of raw tar sands, crude pollution in communities surrounding the refineries where the Keystone Coke XL uh, pipeline would operate. And if you share my commitment to safe safeguarding Americans' health, I ask that you approve my amendment and allow for such a study to be done before we make any decision on the pipeline's construction. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I will reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Georgia reserves his time. What purpose does Mr. the gentleman Chairman. from Nebraska rise? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And, and let me assure the gentleman from Georgia that uh, part of the environmental impact study based on the EPA modeling inherently uh, includes the impact of health around the community. So I am confident that the President, well, the Department of Energy and the Department of State uh, will have the necessary health impact data to make the proper recommendation to the President. And the President will then be able to rely on those or review the data himself before issuing it. But to require an additional study in, on top of the ones that have already been done, appears to me to just simply be an act of trying to slow this down or the process down. And uh, let me remind the chairman that we are on the third year anniversary of this particular application, whereas ordinarily these type of trans-border pipelines applications are resolved within 18 to 24 months. Uh, that the owner Trans-Canadian Pipeline, uh, Trans-Canadian is a Canadian company, they've agreed to all of the recommendations that have come forth from all of the uh, draft environmental impact studies and supplemental. So I really do not want additional studies layered on additional studies layered on additional studies to slow this down. This is a $13 billion construction project not funded by the government, but will employ 
at least 20,000 union contractors and a, a hundred to 200,000 employees to help build the refineries, to work the refineries in the United States. This is the jobs bill. This is getting, uh, getting people back to work. This is an infrastructure bill. Let's get this decision done. The data is available. It can be done by November 1st. I urge the defeat of this amendment, and I reserve. The gentleman from Nebraska reserves his time. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the gentleman uh, from Nebraska is incorrect in terms of the Environmental Protection Agency having uh, conducted a study of the um, increased air pollution that would come as a result of uh, this pipeline's operation. Now, the State Department has submitted two environmental impact statements on the Keystone XL uh, Koch Brothers pipeline, but uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has found that neither statement included a satisfactory evaluation of the increased air pollution that would come as a result of this pipeline's operation. And uh, uh, so I wanted to correct the record on that. And uh, last but not least, I want uh, uh, this uh, body to know that uh, it's the health of Americans uh, that is most important here as opposed to making money for a uh, oil company. Uh, and with that, Mr. Speaker, I'll yield back. The gentleman from Georgia yields back his time. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I hold up the uh, United States Department uh, of State report here, cooperating agencies in the development of the report is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. EPA. The actual study was done by the Department of Energy using the EPA standards and modeling. Uh, so I think that may be where uh, the confusion is entering here. Uh, I didn't state that the EPA uh, did the study. I've always said that the Department of Energy using EPA's modeling uh, and standards did it. But the EPA was a partner in this and had made their recommendations on it. So again, what we're requesting is a redundant study being done, and I urge the defeat of this amendment. I yield back. Members are advised not to traffic the well. Both sides having yielded back their time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. We got asked for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 10, printed in House Report 112-181. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 10, printed in House Report Number 112-181, <laughs> offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. Pursuant to House Resolution 370, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad I'm able to rise uh, and speak about legislation that involves one of our closest allies, Canada. Uh, and because uh, this is a relationship with Canada, and because it is an international issue, I'm assured that in the process uh, we will have significant oversight that includes the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the Secretaries of Defense, Commerce, Transportation, Energy, Homeland Security, and the Attorney General will have to comment on this application before the conclusion and the final decision. That is good news. 
And I also think it's important as we discuss what the potential of this relationship with and the opportunity for oil uh, coming from a friendly neighbor uh, is to be reminded that many of us have said over and over again that we must cease to rely upon foreign oil. In fact, in a Senate hearing, uh, when uh, Egypt was beginning to, uh, in essence, uh, explode, members said, watch Egypt, and we must lessen our dependence on foreign oil. Obviously, uh, Egypt is not one of our major sources of energy, but they were beginning to see the ripple effect uh, in uh, the Mideast, uh, what has been called the Arab Spring, for many of us, we realize that it is a long, long winter uh, as our friends in the Mideast seek peace. So this is an important statement about our commitment to creating jobs, uh, but also it's an important statement on relieving or ceasing the dependence of the United States on foreign oil. Let me just take one state's economy uh, and uh, realize what would happen uh, with this particular uh, effort. $2.3 billion investment in Texas economy, creating more than 50,000 jobs in the Houston area, providing $48 million in state and local taxes, increase the gross state product by $1.9 billion. But I don't choose to be selfish in my amendment, and my amendment is a sense of Congress that says that it is the sense of Congress that the United States must decrease its dependence on oil from countries which are hostile to the interests of the United States. Canada has been a long standing trading partner and increased access to their energy resources will help create jobs in the United States. And if I was to add to that, I would say continue uh, the strong relationship between the United States and Canada. Uh, in addition, I think it's important to note that the President of the United States has indicated that we should increase um, or decrease our reliance on foreign oil. In this instance, I believe uh, that we're making an effort toward that. Uh, do I believe that we should, in essence, cross our environmental T's? Absolutely. So I'd ask my colleagues to support my amendment, and I reserve my time. Gentleman woman from Texas reserves her time. What purpose does a gentleman from Nebraska the, the, rise? I rise uh, claiming the time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized. I uh, would like to inform the chair and the gentlelady from Texas that we think that uh, her amendment reflects the thoughts of the American people, and we agree with it. I yield back. The gentleman from Nebraska yields back his time. The gentlewoman from Texas is recognized. I, uh, I thank the gentleman, and I thank him very much uh, for um, his agreement. Let me, uh, how much time do I have? Left? The gentlewoman from Texas has two minutes. Yeah. Uh, let me um, give a famous quote, can we all get along? Um, I mentioned the different agencies that will have oversight. I've listened to a number of concern about safety, security, and health. I frankly believe we can do it all. Uh, we can increase uh, jobs here up to 300,000, uh, and we can pay attention uh, to the issues of the environment, safety, and security. I think it will be important for TransCanada uh, to be able to address the question of spills. Uh, important for there to be discussions about protecting against toxic chemicals. Important to uh, disarm farmers, when I say disarm them, about fears of the pipeline in their area. I've worked on pipelines. I know there's a lot of work that goes into construction, a lot of overall state laws that regulate the building. And so putting forward more safety procedures and standards being concerned about the public health, uh, and making sure that we address the concerns of all Americans is an important step. But I think we have a bottom line here, the importance of lessening our dependence on foreign oil and as well uh, to be able to ensure uh, that jobs are created here in America. That's what we have sent to Congress to do, to create these jobs, to stand alongside of our neighbors and make sure they have a safe environment while they work and produce an economy that is known only to America, the greatest economy in the world. I ask my colleagues to support this amendment, uh, and I yield back the rest of my time. All time having been expired, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to.
It is now in order to consider Amendment No. 11, printed in House Report 112-181. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, rise? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment No. 11, printed in House Report No. 112-181, offered by Mr. Kucinich of Ohio. Pursuant to House Resolution 370, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Americans are turning to the federal government for relief from high gas prices. However, improvement of the Keystone XL pipeline will lead to exactly the opposite result. It will actually raise gas prices, principally in the Midwest. In fact, some of the states that will suffer the worst gas price increases uh, are the same ones that will have to bear the environmental burden of this pipeline. This is not just my conclusion. This is the conclusion of TransCanada, the company that wants to build the Keystone XL pipeline. This is the conclusion of international energy consultant Pervin and Gertz Incorporated, the company that TransCanada hired to evaluate its Keystone XL pipeline. And this is the conclusion of respected oil market uh, economist Philip Verliger. This is why TransCanada wants to build this pipeline. My amendment simply requires the Secretary of Energy to analyze the effect of the proposed pipeline on increased gas prices for American consumers and to determine if this pipeline is just an effort to manipulate the market for crude oil in the United States. The proposed pipeline would carry up to 900,000 barrels per day of tar sands oil from Alberta, Canada, over 2,000 miles to refineries on the U.S. Gulf Coast. Proponents have claimed that it would bring down oil prices. However, TransCanada's permit application to the Canadian government for the pipeline included documents and testimony which said Canadian oil companies could use the pipeline to increase America's fuel bill by up to $4 billion per year by limiting the supply of Canadian crude to Midwest refineries and rerouting it to Gulf Coast refineries. This benefit to Canadian oil companies was used by TransCanada to argue that approval of the pipeline was in Canada's interest. But this information was conveniently hidden when TransCanada applied for the U.S. presidential permit from the State Department. This information comes from a report by international energy consultant Pervern and Gertz Incorporated the company that TransCanada hired to evaluate its Keystone XL pipeline. In Section 343 of their report, they concluded there was an oversupply of crude oil in the Midwest that resulted in lower prices for Canadian crude oil and that the Keystone XL pipeline would remove this oversupply and raise crude oil prices in the market. In Section 345 of their report, they recite that, quote, Keystone has reviewed the PGI assessment and agrees with its conclusions. Through manipulation of U.S. oil markets, the Keystone XL pipeline will increase U.S. gas prices by 10 to 20 cents per gallon across the United States, according to respected oil market economist Philip Berliger. However, the greatest price increase, twice as much by one estimate, will occur in 15 states, including my state of Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, and Wisconsin. It is estimated to increase prices by $6.55 per barrel of crude oil in the Midwest and $3 per barrel across the U.S. This market manipulation will gouge American consumers, forcing them to hand over up to 3.9 billion hard-earned American dollars to foreign oil companies every year. Well, this boom may benefit TransCanada and Canadian oil sh uh, sharehold, uh, shareholders. It will only further devastate the American people and our economy and farmers who are already struggling financially and can't, af can't afford a gas price hike. Americans want low gas prices. Permitting the Keystone Pipeline will deliver the opposite by increasing prices at the pump and making Americans pay more and more for almost every commodity they purchase. I urge my colleagues to protect Americans 
from being further gouged by foreign oil companies and to support my amendment. And I uh, uh, reserve the balance of my time. Ohio reserves his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Nebraska rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. I strongly oppose this amendment. This is a poison pill, uh, especially as the way that this amendment is worded. Now, the reality here is when this infrastructure uh, of the pipeline is completed, two American U.S. refineries that are expanding to be able to accept this additional crude from Canada, we will have a reliable supply of at least 700,000 barrels per day. Not relying on the Middle East, as the gentlelady from Texas just spoke about, where in the Arab Spring provided great uncertainty, of which then maybe speculators uh, took advantage of. But the reality here for the U.S. markets is that we won't have to deal with that uncertainty if we continue to take steps like the Keystone XL pipeline. Once again, a reliable, reliable resource of 700,000 to 1.3 million barrels per day will only deflate prices at the pump. That's what the American citizens want. They want stability and reduced prices at the pump. It is a bogus argument to say that this pipeline is going to lead to an increase at the pumps. It just doesn't make sense. The re now, what, the stra what I believe is a strained conclusion of a comment made by a trans-Canadian employee that they can actually charge more. Well, the reality is crude, heavy crude is heavily discounted when compared to a sweet or lighter crude that is easier and less costly to refine. So there is a discount in there. But if you have a pipeline that then easily transports and eliminates a lot of the cost of transporting, and you have reliability that does slightly increase the value to those buyers of that crude in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and other parts of the Midwest. So the reality is this heavy crude still will not rise to the price of a sweet crude. The reality is the reliability of this oil coming to U.S. refineries will lower the price at the pumps, and that's what we should be doing. Besides all of the jobs that will be created from this pipeline, 20,000 direct jobs created from this pipeline energy security, an additional 100,000 to 200,000 jobs created on top of the construction. So we need to move. We need the decision made. The data is here. They have enough time for additional comments to be able to make the decision by November 1st, and I urge the defeat of this amendment and reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Ohio has 30 seconds. Uh, could I ask the chair how much chair time the chair say? You have 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the bottom line is that people whose jobs depend on their being right and a company with billions of dollars at stake all concluded that increases in price of gas will especially hit the Midwest as a result of this pipeline. These aren't just employees of uh, TransCanada. These, these are people who are experts. They are legal experts who put this in an application. These contentions, it's not a bogus argument. If it's, that's a bogus argument to my friend, 
then that information should be conveyed to the government of Canada because TransCanada's permit application, the Canadian government, for a pipeline included documents and testimony which said that Canadian oil companies could use the pipeline to increase America's fuel bill by $4 billion per year by limiting the supply of Canadian crude to Midwest refineries and rerouting it to Gulf Coast refineries. Stand up for the American consumer. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Nebraska has a minute remaining to close. American workers, American consumers will be better off. They will reap the advantages of a reliable source of energy, eliminating or at least greatly reducing the uncertainties that cause the gas spikes prices uh, at the pump. So let's defeat this amendment and I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields back all